Hello, class. My name is Jim Ducer. Welcome to Business 132. Is it uh, business and ethics that we kind of go, go, got going on here? Our business and society, business ethics, all that kind of good stuff. Um, let's roll through, actually a little bit about, about me. My name is Jim Ducer. I've been teaching at Citrus for probably five, six years now. Um, my little bit about my background, I own you know, some businesses and stuff in the past, um, actually quite a few. Then I went to um, decided I went to undergraduate at Cal State Fullerton. Then not that much of a business background. Their family was coming like family of entrepreneurs. And then I decided I needed to kind of sharpen my business skills, so I ended up going getting my master's degree at Chapman University. Um, did that, and then you know probably about mm, about eight nine years later, I got into um, higher education. I'm probably about six seven years later, I got into higher education, started teaching at Citrus. Uh, now I have a, uh, uh, I'm full time over at Chapman University in Orange. My full time day job, I'm the director of undergraduate programs and career advancement. So my office is in charge of getting students jobs here at Chapman and uh, the overall success of students. And I teach a couple marketing classes here as well, in addition to Citrus College. So with that said, we're going to get into the syllabus and um, a little bit about, about my teaching philosophy. Let's have some fun, let's grow a little bit, and uh, let's learn at the same time. Uh, but uh, best way to contact me, I'm going to tell you, is going to be through my Chapman email. I'm going to share it with you right now because I will get literally 1,500 emails on that one. My sister's one, I'll get maybe you know one or two, maybe three a week. So that's the best way to get in touch with me. And I'll show, show that with you in one moment here. Let me do a share screen. Here we go. Share this screen. Let's go over the course syllabus. So today we're going to go like literally right into the course syllabus. And then right after that, we're going to go into um, the first chapter one. So fall 2022, uh, business 132, business ethics and society. I don't like how it looks up there. Uh, here's a syllabus, business 132, business uh, ethics and society. That's my name right there. Student hours. I used to, used to call them um, office hours, but students, you know, especially if it's your first time, first semester in college, um, uh, you might think office hours, that's when you get in trouble or that's when you should not uh, disrupt the instructor, but no, that's time for us. Fridays, 8.30 to 9 a.m. Um, I will post the link for the um, for the Zoom for that and just hop on. If you have any questions about the class, what's going on, or just want to chat in general, you can reach, uh, contact me there. So it's student hours are Friday, Fridays, 8.30 to 9 a.m. My phone number, feel free to text me if you want at any time or give me a call, 714-624-4451. There's my email. It's my Citrus College email, the djducer at citruscollege.edu. And then the what the Chapman email is the one that I I literally will open up the Citrus email in the morning when I'm getting ready and you know going through my you know my fantasy sports kind of stuff and uh, going through all my daily stuff I got to check in the, in the morning I'll check out I'll check my my Citrus email in the morning the next time I'm gonna I'm gonna check it is gonna be literally 24 hours later so um the but that the Chapman email is I have I'm, I'm a myriad of, of emails that come through there um uh. Uh, in a day, in an hour, almost every minute. So, um, so you're you're required to know and understand all the requirements of this class. Read the entire syllabus. Here's a course description. This course will examine ethical issues in business. This is a fun class, I think. In uh, in business, using an interdisciplinary approach, drawing from philosophy and business management. This course will analyze the empirical and normative factors involved in uh, choice, types of ethical theory, and the nature of moral standards and judgment in business. Topics will include environmental concerns, the distribution of wealth, informational ethics, privacy and autonomy, affirmative action, and social problems. Uh, these will be discussed in the context of moral theory, such as utilitarianism, uh, deontology, and ethical egoism. Um, those seem like big fancy words, but we'll get into those later. Student outcomes for this class. You're gonna, have, you're gonna understand business ethics and how ethic Ethics uh, integrate into managerial and organizational decision-making, decision understand sustainability issues, including the triple bottom line, the circular economy, climate change, and business measures of sustainability, understand the stakeholder management perspective and identifying the various groups or individuals who have stakes in a firm or its actions, decisions, policies, and practices, and incorporate the stakeholders' concern into the firm's daily operations and strategic plans. Lots of verbiage there, but we'll break it down and make it easily. Uh, the digestible textbook. You only need one, one textbook for this class, Business and Society. The authors are Carol and Brown. It's available through Cengage, and that's the um, the book number. It should be available in the in the, in the uh, bookshop. If not, find it online. I think right now it has the 11th edition. I don't think there's any 
any difference, main difference between like the ninth, 10th, and 11th. Um, course instruction, online instruction, read the material. Um, and basically, so how it's gonna work, you read the material, you should read the material, I'm gonna give a lecture, and then I'm gonna give a quiz. The quizzes are due. There's gonna be 15 quizzes, I believe. Um, I'm gonna post them every week, but you do not have to turn these quizzes in until the last week of the semester. So you'll have the entire time, but if you get, if you get behind, you're gonna be in trouble. So just submit those as you go. It's the best way to do it. And then the final will be kind of a comprehensive final of a, say, basically accumulation of all the quizzes. So don't get behind with the quizzes. Um, and etiquette, this is a business class and therefore it is a good practice to use proper email etiquette when emailing. Uh, so basically, essentially, when you see a quiz come up, just watch the lecture, watch the video, look at the slides, do the quiz. It's per, per, pretty easy, pretty straightforward. Um, I have had, I've had this, I've done this kind of this methodology, this modality before with teaching. Um, I did add a, a trick question in every, um, every, uh, every video. I have like an Easter egg question, which is worth one out of 10. And it's just going to be at some point somewhere randomly within the lecture. It's probably going to be some kind of personal question. Um, but you have to, and you but I'll know if you've, if you've paid attention and you've watched the videos by, um, watch the lectures by how you do on those. So, um, etiquette. Uh, I don't reply to emails received on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Actually, I, I do. So that, that's kind of a little misnomer, but it's, mu it's much better if you just uh, simulate the emails uh, earlier in the week. It's your responsibility to make sure that, all, that I receive all your work. Do not delete emails from your sent folder. Your sent folder will provide a record just in case there's an issue with receiving your assignment. Email requirements. You basically, essentially, it's something called FERPA, which is the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act. It basically protects you and your rights as a student. I mean, that means I can only reply, legally can only reply to emails from your, um, from your Citrus College email address. The reason being is that, so that ensures that is you, okay? Not somebody else posing as you, it's for your protection. So quizzes, there will be 15 quizzes. These are open note, open book. Each quiz is worth 6.67% of your grade. There will be no late quizzes that I'll accept because everything's going to be done at the end of the uh, and you'll see the due date on the quizzes as I post them. They're due basically uh, the week before the final. So we one examination, multiple choice, short answer, essay questions. And here's essentially what we're going to kind of go over. Week one, the chapter one, then quiz one. Week two, chapter two, quiz two, and so on. There'll be some weeks we kind of double dip. On the week of Thanksgiving, I am going to post one up there. But you know what? You do it, when it, you do it whenever, you, whenever you want to. Once again, you can do these at your pace, at your leisure. Um, and then on that final week, the week starting of um, uh, December 12th, I'll put that, that final up there and um, do it, you know, like I said, at your time, at your leisure grading scale, your, your, your traditional, uh, starting at 100, 100 down to 90 is an A, and then 89 to 80 is a B, 79 to 70 is a C, and so, and so forth. Drops and withdrawals, it's your 100% your responsibility to drop uh, withdrawal from the class. You're adults now, and I shouldn't be chasing anybody for um, to find out, you know, what you're doing, where you're going, and, you know, what's, what's going on um, with you. If you need help with anything, you have any questions, um, you know, just want to reach out about, about anything, you know, even any, any, any bigger life situations, feel free to reach out to me. But once again, we're adults, and let's, uh, you know, act as such. So um, here's the, and then if you need some, any type of uh, additional services, like the Disability Student Pro, uh, Programs and Services, the D, DSPNS, let me know. If you need maybe some more times on your quizzes, I give you plenty of times time on the quizzes. Ooh, that reminds me, I might have to kind of adjust that time for the first one. Um, just let me know if you think you need more time, um, but you should have plenty of time for these quizzes. Uh, the first quiz is actually already up. So um, I think I might have to adjust the timing. I forget what I put on there, but. So with that, let me just stop sharing and we're gonna get into that first lecture. All right, this is us, Business 132, Jim Ducer, Chapter 1. The world is changing. It almost sounds like that one, um, what was it, Smashing Pumpkin songs? The world is a vampire. The world is changing. There's an ever-changing business world. Many challenges. And it's very difficult for everybody, especially people, you know, in your age group sometimes to navigate through how complex the complexities in the world 
what's going and you're getting, you know, exposed some of you for the first time into the business world. So it's challenging to kind of navigate through the complexities and the relationships with, with business, with society, with stakeholders. We'll get into stakeholders. Uh, I'll get scared of stakeholders now. Stakeholders traditionally can be people who actually have like stake in the company. Stake, S-T-A-K-E, not stake as an S-T-E-A-K that you eat. Well, I did tell you, well, let me think about this. If it was a company that was like, you know, selling, you know, um, uh, uh, meat and beef, then they, that might be a different different definition for stakeholders. So um, the business stakeholders, that could be people who work there, people who have stock in that company, it could be people, it could be customers. It could be people in the, um, in the if you're living in an area, there's going to be a new grocery store or a new Walmart um, uh, they're going to put there. And it might impact you. You could be potentially be a stakeholder. So there's just a uh, many different uh, definitions of stakeholders in business. We'll get into business and the society relationship. What are those responsibilities that business has towards society, towards people, towards the populace? Get into the criticisms about business as an institution, but, but uh, and at, at what they're going to receive, the, the kind of criticism that business has as an institution. And we'll get into the capitalistic system, which business has become a primary target of critics and you can probably see behind me early on a little american flag there am i some crazy patriot nah, not really um you know i love i love this country i love you know business i love capitalism but also i want to make sure everything is personally for me is like hey i want to make sure that it's fair and conscious capitalism so there it is right here capitalism some people say it's the best thing ever it's the thing that that that, that differentiated us between uh you know the rest of the world um but other people say it's the root of all evils. We'll get into all that kind of stuff. We'll get into conscious capitalism. What is conscious capitalism? Those are, those are companies who, you know, yes, they're out there. They have profit motive and there's nothing wrong, nothing wrong with making money, um, but doing it um, for the benefit of uh, the greater good of all. So, and um, stakeholder capitalism. Once again, this like um, stakeholders in companies, is it okay? And how that basically relates to um, 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 to capitalism. We'll get into all that kind of stuff as we go through the program. We'll get the business scandal. I love who doesn't like a good business scandal, right? Volkswagen. I don't remember Volkswagen had a big emission scandal back uh, about five five years ago, five six years ago. General Motors. They had some ignition scandals. So their cars were blowing up. They kind of how much did they know about this? You know, putting people you know in, uh, you know in peril. Takata Corporation, they had, you know, an issue with their um, airbags. I literally had a Volkswagen that was being, that that had uh, an issue with the emission scandals and it had the Takata um, um, airbags in, at the same time. I had two of these at the same time. I made these decent money off of it. Toshiba, they had some kind of really kind of unscrupulous um, uh, accounting and tax practices to kind of uh, cook their books or, infl or inflate their profits. Um, that happened, Wells Fargo, was famous for just kind of just overcharging people for um, overdraft fees. And uh, they got a lot of heat for that. And Purdue Pharma, that's a big one, Purdue Pharma. They basically were one of these companies who were just put out there pushing, you know, Oxycontin and these, and these type of drugs and basically kind of incentivizing um, uh, doctors and pharmacies to prescribe or overprescribe these, n almost knowing that people would, you know, potentially get hooked and addicted uh, to these things. Um, so there's all kinds of business accounts. And when you see that, that does not make business look good. That's why some people, actually some of you probably watch this saying that, you know, business is, business is evil. Business is um, uh, not always evil, but sometimes when there's a profit motive. One huge thing to, to, to realize here is that, you know, when I took off, you know, my, like a first like little advanced corporate finance class in graduate school, we, one of the first things your instructors, professor told us was that, if you have a company or corporation, you have a legal responsibility, legal responsibility to ensure um, shareholder, um, to increase shareholder value. So what does that mean? You have a legal responsibility to make sure that stock price increases. That's your job. It's not the end user. It's not, you know, society. It's not, you know, the customer. It's make sure that that stock is profitable. And I think that's what happens in these situations. A lot of these scandals is that companies are always chasing that profit motive. And if you're, if you're like kind of in the um, management of a, comp of a big corporation, that's a tough job because you're, you're thinking, you're working in a sprint 
and a marathon. Imagine if you're like a runner, you're, 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 you have to be good at sprinting and a marathon. You have that 90 day sprint consistently of, Hey, we have to do our, our we have, to, uh, have our quarterly earnings and quarterly reports that we have to submit. So you have your quarterlies that you have to, that you have to put in every, every 90 days to make sure you're profitable. And then you have, that's the sprint. And then the marathon is to make sure you have that long-term um, viability, profitability to stay, um, uh, to show your company sustainable, not sustainable in the way as we'll get into here about environmental concerns, but sustainable from a profitability perspective. So what's the role of business in society? That's going to be the focus of the class. The role of business relative to the role of government in the socioeconomic system. Um, yeah, the importance essentially of business society and what are the obligations of a company, of a corporation. What must a firm do to consider to be considered socially responsible? What managers must do to, cons to be considered ethical? Was it back to the, what a firm must do to be considered socially responsible? And you have some companies that they absolutely, they walk, they walk the walk. So others don't. You see some companies and it's just a, it's a pure cash grab. And, and because environmental, uh, environmental sustainability is, is popular now and they know there, that there's money to be made there, that's why they're doing it. Have they, all, have they always done it? Probably not. But, um, so what must managers do to be considered ethical? We'll get into that. Um, and what responsibilities companies have to consumers, employees, stakeholders, and communities? Because we're all, we're, all we're all in this together. We're all in the big blue marble together, right? Business. Essentially, what is business? Very simple definition. Business, the collection of private, commercially oriented, profit oriented, organizations ranging in size from one family proprietorship to corporate giants. I know most of us probably have families that have businesses or some of you might even own businesses um, or you have a family owned business. You know, it's that's on the, you know, the size of a one family proprietorship to corporate giants. You're all basically in a, in a kind of playing in the same sandbox. Um, and between these extremes are many medium-sized proprietorships, partnerships, and corporations. So business, businesses can take on many different shapes, many different sizes. Society. What's society? Just a community, a nation, or a broad grouping of people with common traditions, values, institutions, and collective activities and interests. We're all a member of society. The political environment, that's a big one. We'll get into political environment, talk a little bit about lobbyists. Lobbyists get a bad name. I know some, I have some buddies who are into lobbying and every, for, every, for every big positive change to happen from a, you know, from a, um, a legal standpoint or for a law to change, it had to come at some point from a push from. You might think there's this, you know, big, you know, um, uh, uh, these bad guys putting money into, uh, uh, to elected officials' pockets, but some good things happen, happen as well. So the political environment focuses on the process in which laws get passed and officials get elected and all the other aspects of inter and interactions between firms, political practices, and governments. And we'll get into the, the regulatory process. It's how things become laws, like I was just kind of alluding to with some, some lobbyists, and taxation, how, the, how um, uh, taxation drastically affects kind of the political environment and how that directly um, correlates to business, technological environment. That's a total set. We're in the tech, tech, tech time, tech time. I like that it should be a name of a website or a podcast or something. Uh, tech, techie time. Total set of technology-based advancement taking place in society and the world. We are living right in the middle of it. Have we signed away our lives for the robots? Probably we have. Is it there's a toothpaste out of the tube? Most likely. Once you walk into that door of social media, that, that room, that door locks behind you. Can we unwind it? I doubt it. I'm asking myself a lot of questions and answering it. Do you like that? I'm like a lawyer and a witness at the same time. Big data. We talk about that. There's um, about, um, business analytics. It's a big topic and artificial intelligence, AI. Are we going to be, are the robots in control? Are they replacing us? Or as some people say, we think that, you know, we're at the top of the food chain. Humans are better at the top of the food chain above animals. Or is there the concept out there that we are not the top, actually artificial intelligence and and um, the technological kind of tech um, 
uh, versions are higher than us. And we're actually one, we're, we're one step below. I don't know the answer to that. That's something that kind of either blow your mind, make you think about things or make or keep you up at night. Pluralistic society. What is that? What is pluralism? It's essentially just a diffusion of power among society's many groups and organizations. That's kind of that combination of um, business, ethics, and society. Our pluralistic society is one in which there are a wide decentralization and diversity of power concentration. So there's not just the power is is um, with a certain group of people or a certain group of, uh, of this is not like some secret society kind of thing. Those kind of things just do not exist. I know you're something might be, you know, conspiracy theorists and all that kind of stuff. And by the way, I'm 51 years old. Every conspiracy theory that I have been told in my life to this point has not turned out to be true. So that, that's all I'm going to about conspiracy theories. So they're not like the secret society people who are making, making decisions for everything. Um, are there things we don't know about that happen behind closed doors? A thousand percent there are, but um, so it's just basically saying there's a wide decentralization and diversity of power concentration. So that's kind of how it works is that there's not just one person or one small group of, of people in charge of everything. So it has to do a very even distribution of power. Special interest society. It's a pluralistic society, often transforms into special interests. Oh, by the way, here's the Easter egg right here on your quiz. The first concert I saw was Brian Adams. So Brian Adams at the forum. So just remember that for your quiz. This is just to ensure that you're actually watching these videos. Um, it's a good show. The Hooters opened up for them, by the way. Um, went with my sister, her ex-husband, and uh, this this girl, Sam, Samantha. Is her name. And um, she was way out, way out of my league, but I decided to go with her anyway. And my, my, my best friend at the time, Scott, stole, actually stole the tickets out of my room. And um, so what I do? Lot more. Um, so, pluralistic society uh, often transforms into a special interest society. There's something called NGOs, or, or, or non governmental organizations, it can be pretty powerful citizen groups uh, all around the world that basically have special interests in um, uh, for certain topics. And they basically just kind of operate as a large business with kind of a, a kind of an altruistic, altruistic type of um, uh, uh, business mindset. Factors in the social environment. Um, the big factors in the social environment, affluence, we'll get into each one here in a second, education, awareness through media, rising expectations, and then the rights movement. The first one, affluence. What is that? That's just the level of wealth, disposable income, and standard of living in America. The U.S. standard of living has been rising throughout the years, but it's leveling off. You know, it's, you always hear these statistics, like, you know, that, that for the first time in our, in, in, you know, in this American experiment that, you know, Future generations might not be better off than the generations behind us, which is a very good reason that you're taking, a great reason you're taking this class to really look at the relationship between business, ethics, and society. And I say that American experiment is that the American experiment is something that just, you know, it's only been going on for a couple hundred years. Is it uh, the best system in, in, in of government in the world? It's pretty good. Is it perfect? No. Um, and I think one of that is the affluence. It's like, you know, the standard of living has been rising. It might be leveling off, okay? Um, and we'll get into, it's like, you know, what are, what, what's, what's, what's fair in society? What, um, uh, what you have to earn, what should, be, what should be provided? Education. Education is huge. Education is a full, a factors of social environment. Education is a big one. 88% of Americans are high school graduates. Graduates. 32% are college graduates. So if you're in here in this class, Let's hope you're on that 32%. You know, it's, it's, that's, you think that number would be higher. Um, and what I know from getting my undergraduate degree and getting my master's degree is that it just, it's, it's part of who you are, your brand, and it shows employers that you start things or you finish things that, that you start. And you have a certain um, uh, level of, of, of proficiency also with, um, uh, with tasks. And you can play by, you can kind of essentially play by the rules. You can do things kind of in orderly fashion. And um, there's also a certain expectation that they have of you. Awareness of the media. You know, there's a 24 seven television programming right now. Everybody, it's businesses or all businessmen are the villains. There's so many news shows, investigative reporting, always got their microscope on business, what they're doing wrong. Maybe everyone's knows what they're doing right. 
um, we usually if they're doing right, you see like a story, it's like you'll have a story about some company scandal, about some oil spill. And at the end of the hour, there's, you know, some, you know, cute little girl who's selling cookies, you know, for raise money for the, you know, the, the something that happened in the neighborhood or for cancer or something like that. So there are some great things going on out there, but news and the media will obviously concentrate on, um, on, the, on, on the bad stuff. Uh, because that generates eyeballs, generates uh, attention, and gets people outraged, and outrage will keep people um, watching. So primetime programming, so it's right there, business, businessmen are always the villains, they're always the villains, which is a quote from the Economist magazine. And think about all these shows, how they represent business people, billions. You know, you got the guy, I forget, I forget the characters, lead, the lead character's name there. But, you know, he's just some sharky guy, out for money. Better call Saul, you know, some sleazy lawyer. Horrible bosses, Wall Street, the social network. You know, you get some kind of um, um, socially awkward guy who's just going to go out there and take over the world. The Wolf of Wall Street, fun, entertaining movie. But, you know, what does that say really about business? And especially now with social media. Social media, it's so easy for people to get on and just put on something about, uh, you know, some, uh, some horrible that's happened in, in the business world and to get people to chime in, to get into kind of that, that confirmation bias and that echo chamber. It's kind of like, you know, it's, I don't know if any of you have kids out there or you're around children, that, that confirmation bias is that, you know, whenever you read a book to a child at the end of the book, they'll usually say, again, read it again, because you want to keep hearing the same things that make you feel good, right? We're the same thing, same way about the, about you go to the same YouTube channels because it does something for you. You watch the same uh, cable channels because it does something for you. You read the same types of articles because it fulfills something in you. We're not that much different than kids. Uh, rising expectations. So there's that American dream. We all have our expectations. Uh, and then we're talking about the American dream. Like, we know what is that American dream? What we'll to kind of dig into that? 40% of Americans feel like they're living the American dream, which is a decent number, but what about the other 60? What have we done right? What, have, what are we doing wrong? And potentially, how can we fix this? Or do people really want to, have to, to fix this? What lengths do we want to go to to fix this? Um, so we'll get into all that kind of stuff as well. And social problems. Social problems essentially just the gap between society's expectations and the current social realities. Get into the entitlement mentality. You know what? It should be enough to say, hey, listen, I'm here living in the good old US of A. Here's what I should have. I should have a place to live. I should have food to eat. I should have health care. You know what? Or... How much of that should be earned? You know, so entitlement mentality is that general belief that individuals are owed something, a job, education, living wage, health care. You know, when um, the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, or as some people call it, the Obamacare, when that came around, that was a big deal because it was a big deal to, I mean, to think that people would actually, everybody was, would get and is entitled to health care. So, um, for being here in, in the good old US of A. So that was a big deal. That was, that was a big step. The general criticism of business is a use and abuse of power. Business power. What is that? It's just the capacity or ability to produce an effect, have an impact or bring influence to bear on a situation or people. Business power can be used for good and it has been used for good. When you're providing a good or service that basically changes the way people use, live their lives, that's a positive. I know people want to beat up on the Jeff Bezos type people in the world and all these kind of people. We'll get into tax, tax implications, all that kind of stuff later. But, you know, if you look at it, if, uh, you know, a company like Amazon, have they made it difficult for a lot of smaller companies to exist? Yes. Have they improved our lives at some point? A little bit. I think they have. So you have to give a guy like that, you know, credit for that. Um, also, are, are they paying their fair share in taxes? Probably not. However, this is like, I don't, don't hate the player, hate the game. They are working within the laws that Congress has made for, um, for the tax laws. So it's not entirely their fault. And the levels of business power, we'll talk here and then we'll wrap up, is the macro level, the inter intermediate level, micro level, and then the individual level. And then we'll, you know, just overall do businesses have too much power. The macro level, what's that? Refers to the entire corporate system, corporate America, big business the totality of business organizations. That's the big macro level of business power. Then there's their intermediate level, which is the groups of, or uh, groups of corporations acting in concert in an effort to produce a desired effect, to set prices, uh, control markets, 
dominate purchasers, promote an issue or pass or defeat legislation. Biggest one for that is OPEC, Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. They basically set oil prices. Are they doing that in a kind of a transparent way? Probably not. Um, and so every time you're, you know, you're looking at, you know, the price of gas, there's, this is it right here, the intermediate level of, of basically groups of corporations looking to set prices, control markets. So if you want to get, uh, have some interesting um, reading, dig into OPEC and see what they do. Micro level, it's a level of individual firms. The exertion of power or influence by any major corporation, like for example, Facebook. Well, how much power does Facebook have? Google, how much power honestly does Google have? They have a lot, so does Facebook. Walmart, how do they basically control you know, uh, a huge portion of retailing? Amazon absolutely controls online retailing. Um, but with Amazon, for example, uh, we'll, get, we'll, get, we'll get that later. Um, Apple, the control Apple has on um, devices, on how you get information, how um, your information, how your information is shared, how they know where you are. Um, those are important things. And then Microsoft or some, even a company like Nike. Then there's individual level, individual corporate leaders. How much power do they have? Similarly, like a Mark Zuckerberg, because he's got a lot of power. He's got, I forget how many board seats he has. So he'll always have control of that company. There's no, he would, the only time he would not have a control of that company would probably be when he dies because the way he's, the way the company's structured. Tim Cook, CEO of Apple. Elon Musk, uh, you know, we know Elon Musk, Elon Musk, a very powerful guy. And then a guy like Warren Buffett um, from Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, the change in social contract. We're getting a lot into the social contract. What is the social contract? Just the business society relationship is through the concept of the social con contract, which is what are the expectations that business should have a society and so society should have a business. So the social contract is just a set of reciprocal understandings and expectations that characterize the relationship between major institutions, in our case, businesses, business and society. And then a social contract between business and society. The two main ways um, are laws and regulations and then the shared understandings. So laws and regulations that society has established as a framework within which uh, businesses must operate in the relationships with the stakeholders. Once again, let's read that again. Laws and regulations that society has established as the framework within which business must operate the relationship. So this is essentially, here are the laws, here are the, here are the regulations of how a business needs to operate, right? And then the shared understandings that evolves over time as to each group's expectations of each other. Here's what, and don't, for, don't underestimate the power of, of the um, consumer, right? These are voluntary understandings for mutual benefit. Okay, and, and but they know, like a company knows, hey, here's the laws, here's the expectations. But if they do not, if the consumers say, you know what, I'm not doing this, then the companies, those suppliers, they're going to have to change or else, or else somebody else will. That's it. So um, with that, you have everything that, that you need. Um, watch that video. You'll have this. The slides are up. I'm sorry. And then I, I, I will post the quiz. And then the slides as well. So you can go off of the lecture, look at the slides, and then do the quiz. The quizzes, like I said, are due. Um, uh, when the quizzes do, the quizzes are due not until the last week of, of class. So any questions, reach out to me at either J Ducere at Citrus College at edu or D U S S E R R E at Chapman Edu. Anything? You have any questions? Let me know. If not. See you next time.